Everybody is on mute and I just ask that you stay on mute until after the presentation. And then if you have questions, then um, you can unmute yourself and ask. You can also ask questions in the chat and we can um, you know, answer them after. Ken can answer them to the best. I'm sure he will knock you away with his answers too at the end. Yeah. Um, and we will go from there, okay? So I'm Jessica Lash. I'm head of adult services at Slane District Library. Again, thanks for joining us. Uh, tonight, we are here to talk to uh, Ken Quattro, who is a Celine-based writer, a comics historian, and he is talking about his new book, Invisible Men, the Trailblazing Black Artists of Comic Books. All right. Okay, ben, well, thank it is, You've got the floor. Okay, well, thank you, Jess. <laughs> I am an invisible man. No, I'm not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I'm a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. When I first read those words years ago in Ralph Ellison's prologue to his classic novel, Invisible Man, I thought I understood what they meant, the crippling isolation all people feel at times when the weight of the world is set upon them. It wouldn't be until decades later that I realized how wrong I was and that I had no idea what the author had meant. My name is Ken Quattro. I am the author of Invisible Men, the Trailblazing Black Artists of Comic Books. And while the title indicates that comic books are my entry point into the lives of the artist's profile, the fullness of their life stories revealed so much more. As with most comic book readers, I began young. My comic book reading transpired mostly throughout the 1960s. I grew up with Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, the Hulk. By the time I reached my teens, though I was enamored by the history of the medium itself, the artists and writers who created the comics and not just the comics themselves. Over the years, I've written thousands of articles concerning comics history. And about 20 years ago, I began researching one artist in particular named Matt Baker. At the time, very little was known about Baker. He is revered, revered by old time comic book fans as one of the greatest artists of the so-called golden age. But his personal story had never been fully told. All that we knew was that he died young and that he was black. In fact, many thought that Baker was the only black artist to have worked in comic books during the 1940s. And that always struck me as odd. How could a thriving industry centered in New York City, employing thousands of people, only have one black person working in it, even during the era of segregation. So for several years, I tried to cover what I could find about Matt Baker, which is basically nothing beyond what most already knew. Finally, one of my inquiries prompted someone to suggest to me that I contact a retired black cartoonist from Philadelphia named Samuel Joyner. I obtained his address and wrote to Mr. Joyner expecting little in return. And I was shocked at what I did receive. A wonderful four page later letter telling me now he had met Matt Baker, but also several other comic artists he had known as a young man. Along with the letter, Mr. Joyner had hopefully included some newspaper clippings and photocopies to augment his words. I wrote back and we enjoyed a short but fruitful correspondence for a time. My curiosity peaked. I took those bits of information provided to me and tried to expand upon them using my usual reference sources, contemporaneous newspapers, magazines, and books. But sadly, these sources, which I relied on so often before it failed me. It dawned on me I was looking in the wrong places. These artists I was trying to uh, locate were all black. So I began to look into the black media of the time period. Unfortunately, as I found out, it wasn't that easy. While many libraries and archives exist uh, containing mainstream white newspapers, very, very few kept uh, black newspapers. And invariably, most institutions never considered them worth keeping. As a result, I had to compile my own archive. Bit by bit, I hunted down and located isolated issues of black newspapers. Sometimes I'd find a few months worth in a library other times it'd be only an issue or two located in a university collection. Eventually, my e efforts enabled me to develop a, a coherent resource and, resource. and from that, I was able to not only find the people I've been looking for, 
but I began to get some understanding of the world that they inhabited. I've always been a history buff and considered myself fairly well versed in American history. Now, well into middle age, it became apparent to me that I'd only seen part of that history. I had only known the traditional version taught to me in my school years, the mainstream version learned from white dominated textbooks. For the first time in my life, I was reading history as seen through the eyes of black Americans. I read literally hundreds of black newspapers. And while my initial reason was to find any re references to the black comic or artists I saw, I found that I was entering a reality separate from any of my experience. Every newspaper I read increased my view and shamed me for my ignorance. Newspapers are said to be the first draft of history. I use them frequently as primary sources in my research because they provide a, a ground level view, a raw, snapshot, a, a raw snapshot of a given moment in time. Contemporaneous newspapers have an immediacy unlike any other medium of past eras and they form the backbone of my research and of invisible men. As my viewpoint on American history uh, widened, I sought out other material to explain more of what I was reading. One essay in particular resonated with me and it provided an insight that brought much into focus. The Negro is a sort of seven, is a sort of a seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with a second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no trust, no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness. The sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his tunis, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps him from being torn asunder. W. B. Du Bois wrote his essay, The Souls of Black Folks, back in 1903 but his words provide a context for the Black American experience for generations both before and after him. Blacks in this country have, said, have had to live in two worlds, the Black world, which comprised their home life and community, and the white dominated world, which they often worked in but had to do so with a forced anonymity. Unseen and unheard, they were allowed access to the second world, but only if they remained invisible. This is what Ellison had meant and what I had not understood when I read his book, as a callow youth. It was an epiphany for me as I pieced together the life stories of the artist's pop profile in the book. Each man was not understandable as a product of the double consciousness Du Bois wrote about. Each man lived the double life imposed upon him by a white dominated society and each dealt with it in his own way. There was one other important leg of my research that should be noted. Each person profiled in the book I performed genealogical research, mostly conducted through Ancestry.com, available to me via my Saline District Library card. I went back generations as far back as necessary to trace the origins of each artist and to provide further context for each individual life. As I should explain, since you may wonder, why there were no female artists mentioned in this book? The answer is simple. To this point, my efforts have revealed no Black female comic book creators working during the years covered which begin with the early years of the modern American comic book in the 1930s and ends in 1950. While some white female, female artists did infiltrate the, male, infiltrate the male dominated comic book enclave in this period, even they suffered the social indignities and prejudices allowed by the era. I can speculate that this was other layer of discrimination that kept black female artists out of the industry, but that is speculation only. Hopefully with time and more black artists come to light, perhaps a woman will emerge as a female pioneer among the male pioneers. As of now, it is only a hope. So to give you some idea of what my research revealed, I selected several invisible men from my book to profile you for you in brief. Adolph Barrow was probably the first black artist to work in the comic book industry and also the most confounding. To begin with, his birth name wasn't the name he'd be known by as an adult. He was born Adolphus Barrow Grappan in Charleston, South Carolina on January 8, 1899. And young Adolphus was named after his father who died of typhoid in October when his son was only nine months old. His mother Georgiana was left a widow to care for two children alone. She took a job as a seamstress, but it wasn't enough. 
A series of financial hardships took the, their toll on the young mother. So when Adolphus was in his early teens, he and his sister were sent to live with his paternal aunt, Eugenia. At age 15, Adolphus contracted typhoid, the same disease that killed his father. The family doctor suggested moving the boy to a less humid climate. So Eugenia took the children and moved to New York City where her, her sister Marie was already living. Eugenia and the children were a mixed race, part white, part black. In the terminology of the time, they were listed as mulattoes. Mulattoes was a term left over from colonial time with colonial origins. Uh, it was used to designate anyone with even one drop of black blood. It was a term used to discriminate by damning his bearer for their sin of having parents from two different races. Eugenia removed that stigma when she moved the family to New York by claiming that they were white on all legal forms, including the census. She was able to do so both since she and the children in her care had skin color light enough that the claim went unchallenged. She made one other change as well. She changed their last name to Barreau, taking the boy's middle name and using it as the family's new last name. Adolphus's name was slightly altered too. He was now known as Adolph Leslie Barreau. The concept of changing one's racial identity of passing for white was fairly common in the early years of the 20th century. By crossing the color line, a black person found themselves with opportunities they never would have had if they stayed within the confines of the racial des designation others had placed upon them. After graduating from DeWitt Clinton High School in Manhattan, Adolph was admitted to Yale of a university he likely never would have had the chance to attend if he had identified as black. Even before he graduated in 1922, Moreau was heading up the art department at a major advertising firm. His advertising worked to high level illustration jobs, high profile friendships, and their friendship as a wit often quoted in newspaper columns. All accomplishments he never would have had outside his grasp of if he had stayed black. By the 1930s, Barreau was working as an illustrator for George Matthew Adams Syndicate, a supplier of material to the newspapers such as comic strips and opinion columns. He was employed to provide the accompanying illustration columns written by the syndicate's owner, George Matthew Adams himself. Adams, who happened to be born right here in Saline, had these inspirational columns advocating hard work, clean living, and homespun American values. Barreau's illustrations would echo the columns would echo the column's view. At the same time, he was working for Adams, so Bro took on work from a vastly more disreputable client. In the early 1930s, Bro began working for a printer publisher named Harry Donenfeld. At the time, Donenfeld was making a move from the printing magazines into publishing them. Bro supplied a comic strip for one of his publications entitled Police Detective. And when that tabloid folded in 1934, Barreau was tapped to provide a comic strip for one of Donafield's soft porn pulps named Spicy Detective Stories. The strip he came up with was Sally the Sleuth. Sally's format was simple. She was a female police detective who had a hard time keeping her clothes on. Usually by the end of her story, she was either nude or nearly so. And needless to say, these pulps catered to men. At the same time, Bulk Pro was making an entry into a growing uh, low rung end of publishing comic books. First envisioned as giveaway premiums for various products, the modern American version of comic books was beginning to take on a life of its own. An enterprising publisher named Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson had formed a company that would publish comics containing newly created material instead of using reprinted comic strips that had already run in newspapers. His first publication was entitled New Fun and one of the artists hired was Barreau. Barreau's contribution to New Fun was the magic crystal of history fantasy strip about two children finding a magic crystal, which allowed them to time travel. The strip soon ended, but Barreau liked the concept of magic crystal so much, he, used, he reused it for a comic strip he, he named The Enchanted Stone of Time. And his strip of this strip was none other than his study employer, George Matthew Adams. Unfortunately, Enchanted Stone also had a short run, so Barreau turned his attention back to comics and to the pulps. To provide material, for these publications, Bro formed a studio of artists, a so-called comic shop, which supplied a publisher with content for their magazines without the need of having an on-site staff of their own. 
This arrangement was to be the standard employed throughout the comic book industry for the next decade. And ironically, it would provide later black comic book artists a means of finding work in the medium. Rowe would draw the, comic, the occasional comic book story himself, but increasingly took on more managerial roles. The comic shop continued, continued supplying comics and pulps over the 1940s and the first years of the 1950s. When his studio closed in 1953, uh, he moved out of the comics and into an editor's job at Fawcett Publishing, where he generally oversaw their publications concerning photography. Rowe never acknowledged his black identity. In fact, he went out of his way to obscure it. He created a fake background for himself that included joining the Sons of the Confederacy organization. And he frequently would write letters to his hometown Charleston, South Carolina newspaper, complaining about the Northern liberals he was living among in New York City. Talented, complicated man, Adolf Rowe passed away on October 23, 1985. And while it may be difficult to fully understand why he chose to deny his blackness so completely, it wasn't a choice he made all his own. If he wanted to succeed as much as he did, society determined he had to be white. The timing of Elder Stoner's career coincided with Groves, but the path he followed was entirely different. Elmer Cecil Stoner was born in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania on October 20th, 1897, the son of a black church pastor. Elmer was also the center from one of Martha Washington's slaves who was freed by the late president's wife soon after his death. Elmer's great-grandmother left Virginia and settled Pennsylvania, the first free state she came to after crossing the Mason-Dixon line. It was a stop by many slaves upon earning their freedom in coming years. Elmer's artistic talent was evident early on, and by the time he reached high school at age, he caught the attention of a businessman named Fred Morgan Kirby. Kirby was the co-founder of the F.W. Woolworth chain of five and 10 cent stores, and he used his vast fortune supporting many philanthropic causes. One of those causes was the advance of civil rights for blacks, and one of the beneficiaries of his largesse was Stoner. Stoner was working as a porter in Kirby's flagship Woolworth store in Wilkes-Barre while in high school when he so impressed the store's owner that Kirby paid for the boy's four-year tuition to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Stoner excelled at the Academy, culminating with his winning the Cresson Traveling Scholarship in 1922, which paid for a summer study for him in Europe. Upon his return from Europe in late summer that year, Stoner went to New York City and became one of the artists featured in the groundbreaking exhibit by Negro artists at the Harlem branch of the New York Public Library. That same summer, he met a young woman named Vivian, Vivian Stor Ward Stokes, a social worker who had recently been named to head up a program to address the housing shortage for black women whose husbands were away serving in the military. Less than a year after they met, Vivian and Elmer got married in June, 1923. Vivian had made many friends through work from various civil rights organizations. And after their marriage, she and Elmer found themselves in the midst of the burgeoning art and literary society scene centered in Harlem. They were part of the social circle, circle which included such Harlem Renaissance luminaries as Sora Neil Hurston, Langston Hughes, and Vivian's closest friend, author Nella Larson. Elmer made some of his first sales as a professional illustrator to a leading Black literary magazine of the day, The Messenger. For several months throughout 1924, he provided both covers and interior artwork for this highly influential uh, publication. Even as his reputation as illustrator and uh, painter was growing, though, his marriage was falling apart. By the late 1920s, Vivian was seen around town dating other men, and by 1930, the, the marriage had ended in divorce. Even so, Stoner had made the rare leap from working exclusively for black publications to commercial art assignments in white media. One of the most prominent clients was the Franklin Automobile Company, a luxury car brand whose Stoner drawn ads appeared in upscale magazines at the very well heeled clients. In the early 1930s, Stoner was once again the beneficiary of his close relationship with Fred Kirby. Curry had started the Tower Magazine line, which was sold solely in his chain of Woolworth stores. He hired Stoner as the company's art director, a position he held until Tower became a victim of the Great Depression and went out of business in 1935. As of many other artists who found themselves without work during the Depression, 
Stoner found temporary employment for the Works Progress Administration, which was a New Deal program formed to create jobs for the nation's many unemployed workers. The jobs assigned to the artists included the painting of murals for public buildings, such as post offices and schools. Some, such as Stoner, were given work in preparation for, up, for the upcoming World's Fair in New York, set to begin in 1939. He was tasked with helping create a diorama for railroads at Work Pavilion and drawing a children's guide to the fair. But all such WPA jobs were temporary, and a recently remarried stoner needed full time work. And this is a painting of his wife, by the way. Just like Barreau, Stoner had found that one of the few parts of publishing that was uh, hiring was the fast growing comic book industry. It didn't pay much, but it paid the bills. Unlike Barreau, Stoner didn't have the option for his passing was white though. He was black and when he started work for the Harry Chesler comic shop in 1935, 1939, he became the first obviously black artist to work <laughs> in the industry. It was the advent of comic shops that allowed black artists to get assignments that they otherwise may have been denied. Some, since most publishers at the time didn't have in-house staffs and artists and writers, they would contract comic shops to produce material for them and work like this. The owner of a comic shop would approach a publisher and ask him how much material they required. A publisher in turn would tell the comic shop owner that he needed enough material to fill X amount of pages in a comic. Then the comic shop owner would go back to a studio and employ as many artists and writers as needed to complete the assignment on time. He didn't care who was doing the work as long as they could do it quickly. This opened the door for black comic artists who would get their assignment from the shop owner, then go back home or to their own art studio and complete it. When finished, the artist would take it back to the shop owner who would submit it to the publisher along with other completed artwork. In this way, the black comic artists avoided confronting the white publishers who often refused to give them work when they came in personally. This provided a buffer between the black artist and the white publisher, but it also resulted in the black artists often working apart from their white artist counterparts. It rendered them invisible to their white peers. Stoner was the first black artist to realize the benefits of the system. He, served, he also served as a conduit for black artists who came along later, hoping to enter the comic book industry and help them get assignments to the various comic shops. Stoner is prolific, drawing covers and interior artwork appeared in comics published by Street and Smith and Dell. But while he was working through the Bernard Bailey shop, he reached the heights of his comic book output. In the years covering 1944 through 1946, Stoner drew every, every single cover of every single comic book published by Fox Features and hundreds of comic book pages for characters such as The Green Mask, The Bouncer, Rocket Kelly, especially The Blue Beetle. One very significant comic book he worked on during this picture, during this period, was The Challenger. The comic was unique and then was produced by the publishers of liberal Protestant magazine and was conceived as a challenge to anti-Semitism and racism found in America at the time. Stoner provided the covers and several interior stories of to the 40 issue series. Stories were written by his wife and work partner, Henriette. By the end of 1946 though, Stoner was out of new stand comics. And like most of the other black comic artists, he stopped getting a sandwich which were now going to the white artists returning from World War II. He didn't leave comic books though. For the next decade, Stoner would find steady work drawing a variety of commercial comic books for companies and organizations looking to promote their product or convey a message. In 1951, Stoner teamed up with Walter Gibson, a white writer who was best known for writing the pulp adventures of the shadow. Interracial team created a science fiction themed comic strip entitled Rick Kane Space Marshal. The Stoner's tenure was short lived as he only handled the art, short, art chores on the strip for uh, four months. In later years, Stoner would concentrate more on his painting, gaining greater respect as a fine artist. In the mid 1960s, he appeared in a long running ad campaign touting Gordon Jen. It ran in such black magazines as Ebony and Jet. Elmer Stoner died in Greenwich Village Hospital in December 1929, 1969, admired by the black community for his many years as a leading artist and social activist, but unrecognized by the comic book industry in which he had worked for almost 20 years. Like Adolph Barreau, 
Owen C. Middleton was born in Charleston, South Carolina. But is there that similarities end? Middleton's life and career went in a far different direction than Barone's. Born in 1888, Owen was the son of a former slave. Before the turn of the century, the Middletons joined the Great Migration North and settled in Cleveland, Ohio. But like his father Jonas before him, Owen worked at various odd jobs before he was accepted at Case Western University, where he studied art. After, for two years in Case, Middleton transferred to the prestigious Art Institute of Chicago for further studies. And while there, he obtained a job at the Chicago Tribune as a sketch artist, becoming one of the first Blacks to work on a white-owned newspaper. Despite these rare accomplishments for a Black man of the early 1900s, Middleton also had repeated run-ins with authorities. As a youth, he got into a fight with a group of white boys. They were released, but Owen was sent to reform school for two years. Even as he was working for the Tribune and attending college, Milton ran afoul of the law when he was arrested for several petty offenses, including the passing of a bad check. Eligible for the draft, Milton refused induction in 1916, claiming conscientious objector status. The problem was, at the time, no such status was recognized by the U.S. government. So he was sentenced to serve time in the federal prison in Leavenworth, Kansas, where he was in prison for the next three years. While at Leavenworth, Middleton was befriended by another prisoner named Big Hill Haywood, one of the leaders of the industrial workers of the world. This exposure to the socialist party, part, politics of Haywood informed Middleton's political viewpoint going forward and involved him with left-wing causes for the rest of his life. Upon his release from Leavenworth, Middleton lived an itinerant lifestyle for a time, drifting from job to job, from a position as a surgical assistant a surgical artist in a hospital, to working as a designer in a West Michigan furniture factory, to serving as a seaman, traveling to seaport to seaport around the world. Milton moved to Brooklyn, New York after returning from his sea voyages, got married and attempted to settle down. Unfortunately, he was able to avoid trouble. In 1926, he was arrested again, this time for armed robbery. This is the fourth, his fourth conviction. And according to New York state law at the time, he was automatically sentenced to life in Sing Sing prison. A doctor in the prison became aware of Middleton's artistic talents. So he utilized him to draw detailed illustrations of the surgeries. The grateful doctor wrote a letter recommending Middleton be granted a pardon. But unfortunately, all became part of the scandal that embarrassed the warden and created unwanted headlines for the prison. It seems Middleton had drawn a sketch and that he asked the guard to smuggle out of Sing Sing to someone on the outside. The guard was caught in the act and fired and since the sketch was, was considered contraband. For his part in this, Middleton was punished by being placed in solitary confinement. Serving life in solitary confinement uh, would seem to be the end of most stories, but a bit of luck changed his outcome. In the fall of 1930, noted author Will Durant was compiling an anthology of responses to the question, what is the meaning or worth of a human life? This inquiry has went out to famous people throughout the world, notable such as George Bernard Shaw, Will Rogers, Mohandas Gandhi. As Durant was finishing up editing a book, he received a letter addressed as coming from convict 79206 Sing Sing Prison. That prisoner was Owen Middleton. The reply was so well thought out and so well expressed, wrote Durant, that it commanded a place in this symposium. It is incredible that we should be unable to find a better use for such intelligence than to lock it up forever. Many others agreed. Middleton's case became a cause celeb, and with the power of public outrage behind him, Middleton was eventually pardoned and released from prison in 1935. He wasted no time in resuming his political activism. Middleton became a noted political cartoonist, with his budding cartoon showing up in Communist Party and Black newspapers frequently. One series of illustrations he drew commented upon the trial of the Scottsboro Boys, a landmark case that tried a group of young black men accused of raping two white women in Alabama. Unlike Burrow and like Stoner, Milton found that being a black artist during the Great Depression provided little paying work. So sometime during World War II, he too found a job drawing comic books. It's almost without doubt it was Elmer Stoner who got Milton into the comic book industry. Stoner was working through the Harry Chesler comic shop in the early 1940s, the same shop 
where Middleton found his work. It wasn't a job that paid much, but comic artists would only save a few dollars per page. Still, it was study work and it paid the bills. Apparently, Middle, Middleton had little regard for comic books he drew. One newspaper interview he gave in 1944, Middleton admitted he had no interest in comics and said he had never read them. Still, for about three years, comic books were Middleton's main source of income. After World War II, like most other comic book artists, black comic book artists, Middleton had to find work elsewhere when the white artists returned. In his case, Middleton became more involved with politics and social causes. In 1948, he worked on the campaign of Henry Wallace, the presidential nominee of the left wing progressive party. Middleton drew informational material for the campaign that was used throughout the country. He also served on the National Council of Arts, Sciences, and Professions, a leftist organization in opposition against the activities of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Milton was politically active at the local level as well. In 1954, he ran as the candidate for the New York State Senate, representing the Bedford-Stuyvesant District of Brooklyn on the American Labor Party ticket. However, in late October of that year, two weeks before the election, Milton died suddenly. Despite his death, the party ran an ad in the New York Amsterdam News asking voters to still vote for him out of respect for his dedication to social causes. The ad read, his spirit, his program, his ideal is the true expression of the Negro people and of their struggles. And the best example of enlightened politics regardless of public opinion, political opinion or party affiliation. In response to this ad and with no chance of serving, after his death, Owen Milton received nearly a thousand votes. Matt Baker is the best known of the first generation black comic book artist and the reason this book exists. Clarence Matthew Baker Jr. was born in 1921 to a family which would like so many other blacks journeying north as part of the great migration. Uh, in search of better jobs, a, standard of a better standard of living of life beyond the restrictive Jim Crow laws of the South. He settled in Pittsburgh, the city built on steel manufacturing, but tragedy followed them. Soon after their move in 1925, Clarence Jr. Sr. died of tuberculosis, leaving his wife Ethel a widow with three children. Ethel found work as a maid, but struggled to support the family until she met and married a man named Matthew Robinson in 1930. The marriage resulted in a large family as Robinson brought five children along from a previous marriage. Young Clarence chose not to use his given first name, preferring to be known by his middle name, Matthew. Early on, he knew his career he wanted to follow. In his 1940 high school yearbook, he flatly stated that his goal in life was to be a commercial artist. In 1942, Matt and his younger brother, John, also an aspiring artist, moved together to Washington, D.C. Even though the United States had just entered World War II, neither of the Bakers was eligible to be drafted. John had a broken eardrum and Matt had heart problems as a result of a bout of rheumatic fever when he was a child. One other factor dictated that they were likely not to be drafted. They were black. In the first couple of years of World War II, local draft boards, which were invariably manned by white men, routinely passed over eligible black draftees. It was thought that they couldn't be trusted enough to serve. It wasn't until later in 1943 that some blacks were finally conscripted along with white inductees. In Washington, Matt found a job at the Navy Department, but apparently the move had provided the opportunities for the brothers had hoped for. And sometime in 1943, they moved to New York City. Here, Matt got a job at the National War Labor Board, working in the mailroom as a clerk. In his spare time, he signed up for an evening art class at the Cooper Union School in the fall of 1943. He only lasted one semester before he quit to take a job with the Jerry Iger comic shop drawing comic books. Baker's first identifiable, identifiable artwork began showing up in various comics that the Iger shop was producing for Fiction House, a publisher whose biggest sellers were jungle comics featuring scantily clad white men when being rescued by virile white Tarzan clones. Luckily for both Baker and his employer, he was a master of drawing beautiful women. Shop owner Iger moved, immediately took note of Baker's talent and wasted no time in having him draw as many comic book covers and stories as he could. Baker quickly became the star of the Iger shop with, art, with other artists in the studio taking time off from their tasks to stand around and, 
his drawing table just to watch him draw. Make it even more remarkable. Baker was the rare black artist who actually worked among his white peers. Baker's artwork created dozens of comic covers for the post-war period. Moreover, he became the gold standard for other artists hoping to mimic his eye-catching style. But perhaps the most important contribution of comics was one of his lesser known efforts. As mentioned, comics of the period were full of white jungle lords, light-skinned saviors, inexplicably dropped into African climes, who spent their days saving equally white maidens from frightened, dark-skinned native tribesmen. Just about every black comic book artist of the period was callously tasked at one time or another in drawing such a stereotypically racist characterization. White editors thought nothing of giving such assignments to an artist, no matter their race, Baker included. But in the summer of 1945, he was given the opportunity to briefly turn the table. In the third issue of an obscure comic entitled Crown Comics, Baker depicted a, a character named Vuda, yet another jungle lord, but this time the skin was appropriately dark colored. This was no printer's error, no unintended use of brown ink instead of pink. No, Baker's Vuda was unmistakably, unapologetically black. How he was able to get the publisher to publish the feature is unknown, but even though this bold depiction appeared on the story inside the comic book, the covered comic book was another thing entirely. While Voodoo was black within the comic, on the cover he was white. This too was no mistake. The publisher was well aware that retailers and distributors, particularly in the southern states, wouldn't put a comic book on stands that featured a black character in a heroic role. In any case, the black Vuda didn't last long. By his fourth appearance in Crown Comics, Vuda suddenly changed skin color in his interior stories as well, and joined the army of other light-skinned jungle saviors populating comics. Baker's talent made him a hot property within the comic book industry. And starting in 1948, he began working for a fledgling publisher named Archer St. John. St. John utilized Baker in a number of different comics in various genres. He even assigned him as the primary artist on experimental concept, combining comic books and paperback books. The result was it rhymes with lust, and they called, and the, they called the concept a picture novel. In modern terms, though, it was an early attempt at a graphic novel. Baker became the art director of the St. John Comics line, and although his work graced everything from crime to war to horror comics, it was his work on the romance genre that cemented his place as one of the greatest comic book Art, cover artists of all time. These covers transcended comic book medium. They were masterpieces. Baker had an eye not just for feminine beauty, but for fashion and design. Many of these covers become iconic within the comic book medium, and rightly so. Unfortunately, though, this high point in comics illustration wouldn't last. In August 1955, Archer St. John died of a drug overdose and much of his staff was let go in the wake of his death, including Baker. The further tragedy of this was that St. John had just started moving his publishing efforts beyond comics into producing slick magazines. Baker was his primary artistic asset, and he finally began recognizing his lifelong dream of becoming a true commercial artist. His illustrations were used in the first few issues of St. John's magazine ventures, but the publisher's demise meant the end of Baker's career as a top-notch magazine illustrator. In the last few years of the 1950s, in the last few years of 1950s, Baker worked as a freelance artist, working for Stan Lee on pre-Marvel Timely Atlas comic books, drawing several issues of Lassie for Bell Publishing, and doing the occasional text illustration for some men's magazines. But sadly, on August 11th, 1959, Matt Baker died of a heart attack at a far too young age of 37. Some people are ruined by adversity. Others rise above it and choose to see it as an opportunity. Warren C. Evans was one of the latter group. Coming out of Steelton, Pennsylvania, a small town in the shadow of Harrisburg where he was born in 1902, Evans was the eldest child of George and Maud Evans, a butler and a music teacher, respectively. Early in his life, the Evans family moved to Philadelphia into a neighborhood and inhabited mostly by white families. His parents had high expectations for their children, so Orrin was encouraged to enter Drexel University, where he pursued in banking. 
It was a short-lived pursuit, though, as he soon left both Drexel and his job at the bank. He made another brief attempt at becoming a pharmacist before he realized that that, too, was not for him. He took his first job in journalism as a sports editor on a black newspaper called the Philadelphia Defender and never looked back. A series of newspaper jobs followed, most prominently at the Philadelphia Tribune and the Baltimore Black, the Baltimore Afro-American. Both were black owned and staffed and Evans became known as one of the top black journalists in America. His reputation was such that he was eventually hired by the white owned Philadelphia Record, one of the city's largest newspapers. He was assigned as the paper's reporter of black news and became nationally recognized for his, his scoops. One such was his reporting on the treatment of black soldiers stationed in Southern states during World War II. This series of articles resonated all the way up to, to the highest ranks of government. And it was read into the congressional record by, by a Pennsylvania congressman and resulted in Evans winning honorable mention by one of, for one of the most prestigious journalism awards in America. At the same time, Evans was quite involved with union activities particularly at the Philadelphia Record. The dispute over raises for the union employees of the newspaper led to a bitter three month strike at the end of 1946, running into 1947. The two sides couldn't come to an agreement. So on February 1st, 1947, the Philadelphia Record closed, leaving Evans and the rest of the staff unemployed. Rather than succumb to despair, Evans looked at his sudden unemployment as a chance to embark on a venture he had been contemplating for some time. He recruited Harry Saylor, the record's former main editor, and several other top editors for a now defunct paper, and they formed All Negro Comics Incorporated. Evans had a vision, and he put it into one succinct paragraph. I see in All Negro Comics a badly needed outlet for the talents of Negro artists throughout the nation. It will not only give the opportunity for their talents, it will give us a medium in which to glorify Negro achievements. While Evans' eventual goal may have included artists from around the United States, in its inaugural issue, all Negro comics creators came from the city of Philadelphia. Warren Evans didn't have to go to find his first staff member, didn't have to go far to find his first staff member. He hired his brother, George Evans Jr., who was taking classes at the Philadelphia Museum of Art School. George, who had started out in hotel and restaurant management, was hoping to pursue a career in commercial art. He was listed as a sole creative lion man, who, like Matt Baker's earlier creation, Buddha, was a Black African-based hero. In this one and only appearance, it is explained that Lion Man was an American-born, college-educated young scientist sent by the United Nations to Africa to protect the magic mountain of the Gold Coast and the uranium it, in, it contained. Along with George, Warren recruited two of his classmates. One was William H. Smith, a highly talented uh, student originally from Baltimore, who had already seen some of his work appear in the Baltimore Afro-American. Smith's contribution to the comic book was Sugarfoot, a feature he chose to sign with the pseudonym, pseudonym of Cravat. It was the humor tip starring a couple of pals who hop on a train and become acquainted with a young country woman and her protective father. The third student, of the Philadelphia, from the Philadelphia Museum of Art was Leonard Cooper, who had first attended school before serving in the army during World War II. With war's end, Cooper re-entered the school. His two, the two features credited to him in Negro comics was Do Dilly's A Sweet Children's Tale involving black fairies and a single page entitled Hep Chicks on Parade, which contained four individual panel cartoons based around extravagantly fashionable black women. The final and most, most important artist hired by Evans is John H. Terrell. Terrell was already gainfully employed as the safety officer at the Philadelphia Naval Yard, where he was in charge of creating posters and other material, teaching safe work habits to the workers. More directly related to what he'd be doing for Evans on, in all Negro comics, Terrell had been a professional cartoonist, having drawn a strip entitled The Adventures of Tiger Rag that appeared in issues of the New York Amsterdam News throughout 1940. Terrell was given the honor of drawing both the front and back covers for all Negro comics, a, a humor strip, Little Eggie featuring a black husband and wife, and the comics main feature, Ace Harlem. 
Ace Harlow was a no nonsense, no nonsense police detective in the manner of Dick Tracy, even resembled his white counterpart with a fresh and ridiculous fedora. The story was somewhat brutal, with several murderers and murders depicted, and the main villain, the police, ending up strangled on a chain he intended to use as a weapon. Orrin Evans edited all Negro comics and presumably had a hand in most of its creation. This mixed bag of features would write and step with other mainstream comic books it hoped to share a newsstand with. According to several sources, the comic had a print run of 300,000 copies, which would be distributed throughout the United States and the West Indies. The comic itself got a lot of publicity from both white and black newspapers. The noted black journalist and editorial writer, Georgia Schuyler of the Pittsburgh Courier, tottered all new Negro comics as in every way equal to similar comics on the market, except that is better than most of them I have seen. And while none other, also none other than Rose, Eleanor Roosevelt, FDR's widow, agreed in her daily column that the comic compared favorably with the best of the comic books. Every black newspaper covered uh, all Negroes released to some extent and expressed high hopes for its success. Those hopes were soon dashed, however, by reality. Even though a second issue had been drawn and ready for publication, it was not to be. According to family sources, when it came time to purchase the paper needed to print the second issue, no paper mill would sell to Evans because he was black. So ended Evans' dream of a black owned comic book created by black artists and writers. It'd be two more decades until someone would attempt that again, when Bertram Fitzgerald founded a Golden Legacy comic series in the 1960s. Orrin Evans re-entered journalism and went on to have a distinguished career lasting into the 1960s. He had passed away in 1971. Each of the other art of the creators involved with all Negro comics also achieved success in their chosen fields. George Evans became a commercial artist. Leonard Cooper did as well, and even found work in some Hollywood films. William H. Smith became a noted painter and a sculptor. And John H. Terrell became nationally known authority on a safety, achieving such notoriety that he was featured in a Viceroy Cigarettes ad in random black newspapers in 1957. My goal with each person profiled in this book was to provide context for their lives, the environment to form them. While each artist and invisible men worked in the comic book industry, the totality of their lives revealed so much more. Each story was unique, sad, joyful, triumphant, tragic. Each man was reviled, honored, hated, and loved. But most importantly, each artist was more than what they drew for money. One thing they all shared was that for far too long they lingered out of mind and out of sight of their lighter skinned peers, evading the scrutiny of historians and the eyes that looked past them to everyone who saw only their skin color and then saw nothing more without body or substance as if they were invisible. And that is my presentation. Thank you. Were there any uh, questions? If anybody has any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask or you can um, type it in the chat. Or comments, you could have some comments too. Okay. Nothing. I think <laughs> you you guys are very very quiet tonight. Oh, I think I'm going to sleep. <laughs> Hi. I, think, I have a question. If I can. Um, yeah, go yeah. for it. Um, sorry, it took me a while to do all undo all the clicks to become visible. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for that. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I, I'm just, this is all new to me. Um, and I wondered, um, Ken, I was uh, learning about your book today and I looked at a New York Times review and they mentioned that you might be working on kind of an extension or, or going into the, um, the next I don't know yes. if it's a bridge call it era of comics. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, 
because of uh, space uh, constrictions and that I only had, um, I had to cut off um, everybody I wanted to cover in the book with 1950. Um, there obviously were more men who were black men who worked in comics, but they came along later. So what I've already been working on is I've been, this has been an ongoing thing I've been doing for uh, almost 20 years now. Um, I'm still researching and I'm still writing and I'm compiling enough and I'm already working on the second book. And along with it, I've started a, a, a website. Uh, it's just Invisible Men um, blog and uh, at wordpress.com. And what I'm doing is I'm giving people an idea of my ongoing research and I'm giving little bits that, that didn't show up in the book. Uh, it's, it's sort of like a supplement to the book that it's, it's, you know, so it's an ongoing thing. It's like a living document to, in my mind. And it's something I'll just keep adding to as time goes on. And hopefully other people will pick it up too. And other people will also uh, do research into it. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, where did I get the photos? Okay, they came from many different sources. Uh, like I said, I've been doing this for 20 years. Some came from um, uh, personal photos that uh, people have obtained from family members. Uh, some came from uh, these old black newspapers that are uh, most, a lot of them are uh, no longer uh, published anymore. And uh, it's like archival material that I found along the way. It's taken me a long time to find most of this stuff. And it's, um, most of these have never been uh, republished in recent years. They haven't been seen in, you know, decades. And it's a, uh, it's kind of a shame that, you know, um, these black newspapers and the black media was never uh, accumulated by one, you know, uh, archival source. And then I even spoke to the, recently at the Library of Congress to the uh, head librarian about that. And she agreed that, you know, it's a shame that it's never been compiled into one uh, researchable resource. But the problem is, is that most of these newspapers were thrown out. And so, you know, I'm doing all I can to try to digitize as much as I can and uh, make it available to people. And I see somebody ask a question about Ollie Harrington. Uh, Ollie Harrington was obviously a, a great you know, black cartoonist. There was many great black cartoonists, you know, Ted Shearer, Mel Tapley, you know, on and on and that, E. Sims Campbell, but they fall outside the purview of this book. Because if you look at the title, I uh, concentrated on comic books. Um, comic books are, are very specialized form of publishing. And they were very unique uh, in the sense of like uh, the job opportunities they, they provided the blacks. Um, Ollie Harrington and most of the black uh, cartoons you may have heard of worked almost exclusively in black newspapers. Uh, a few were able to cross over like E. Sims Campbell and um, well, even Elmer Stoner. But for the most part, they were, uh, you know, just they were only able to publish in, within the black media. Comic books was the rare and almost only uh, form of commercial artwork the blacks were able to find, find work in. And that's why I concentrated on just the comic book artists uh, for this book, um, you know, because they were able to the break through what they, they call the veil. It's a, a, a the permeable veil that exists between the white and the black worlds, and that they were able to work to go back and forth between those two different worlds. It's um, hard for, for people of uh, of our day to understand that um, the the two worlds that blacks existed in back in that time, it was very real, but it was almost not recognized by, uh, by the white people of the time. They didn't even consider blacks on the same par with them in a lot of ways. And uh, most blacks of the time period worked in very menial positions. And that's what Ellison, Ralph Ellison spoke about when he talked about being an invisible man uh, the biggest employer of blacks in 1940, which is just prior to World War II in this country, was as Pullman porters on trains. You know, uh, most blacks were either butlers, they would work in um, as waiters, uh, you know, 
most jobs where they never even had a chance to interact with white people. And it's, it's a very interesting circumstance is that even if you look at old movies, if you do see a black, it's in a, a, a menial job and they're rarely spoken to by the, uh, the white stars you know, in the movies. So it, it was a very unique situation. It's hard for us nowadays to, you know, to, to fully grasp. And um, you know, that's what I, I try to convey with this book. You'd have to read the entire book because there's much, much more to it than just this. You know, I've skimmed over an awful lot here. I just gave you a little tiny bit of what it's all about, but I go into all this uh, in a lot of detail in each man's story and in my uh, forward to the book. And I also would recommend that people read the introduction to the book if you do read it, because it's written by a, a brilliant uh, cultural anthropologist, a friend of mine. He's Dr. Stanford Carpenter. And uh, Stanford uh, is, is, a, is a black professor from uh, Chicago. And uh, he gives a different viewpoint on um, my research here that, that I, I think is, is worth people reading. If you read the book, I, I thoroughly encourage you to read the two pages that he wrote as an introduction because it gives you even a fuller understanding of what the book's about. Um, like I say, uh, comic books were the entry point for me into the, the lives of these men, but there's so much more to them than just working in comic books. And I, that's, that's what I hope that people get from this, that there's more to people than just, you know, a one given period or one given job that they do in a lifetime. And it, as was with each of these men, because each one of them was extraordinary in their own way. Uh, the library does own the book and it is available to check out. It's an absolutely beautiful book. So I highly recommend that you place yeah. a hold on it. Um, yeah, I was very excited to receive it, so. Thank you. Thank you. Well, like I said, you know, I, I've spent a long time in this book and um, it's gotten a lot of uh, attention around the country from a lot of important people, including the head librarian at the Library of Congress who uh, contacted me recently and she's a big fan of the book and uh, we had a nice talk about it. And um, like I said, there's a librarian. I geeked out over that information. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like, good, really? Jess. Okay. Was there anyone else? Anything else? Any other questions or comments? Well, I'm good. If everybody's okay, I really appreciate you folks uh, showing up and putting up with me. I'm not a professional speaker, so uh, I'm, gl I'm gl glad you uh, made it through this. Okay. Well, thank you, Jess. I think- Yeah, uh, librarians. Hi, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> another librarian. Well, good. I love librarians. That's great. Yes. Oh, thank you guys very much for joining us. And um, I know I learned a ton. And I'm, I didn't read the book cover to cover because I received it and then had to put it in the collection because I got a request for it like the same day from actually one of my coworkers. <laughs> so and he was super excited to get it. So I will be placing a hold on it myself. Um, <laughs> Yes, to read it. So, you know, you guys may well, have you to could, You could order it. multiple copies. I could Jess. order, actually, I, would, I will probably order another copy. Oh, well, that's so. great. <laughs> well, once that once the, the, the pandemic's down, I'll come over there and maybe we can have a book signing for everybody or something. That would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. Right. Jackie Orms, author here. Oh, yes. Jackie Orms is, is another person I get asked a lot about. And uh, obviously, you know, she fell outside the purview of this book. I was desperately hoping to find something by Jackie Orms uh, in a comic book. Unfortunately, it wasn't. But I'm uh, still looking and uh, still digging. And if you ever find anything about Jackie Orms in a comic book, please let me know. I'd appreciate it. Anyway, I think that's probably it. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Celine Library. And I think that's it. Thank you very much, Ken. And you guys have a good night. I'd say drive safe, but you're probably already home. So, you know, I guess walk into the other room safely. That's right. That? Okay. Well, good night, right. folks. Take care.